Reason Podcast does not believe in curses or hexes and is unconcerned with what offends you. We do not believe that words have the power to compel spirits or demons to affect your life in any way. If you do, well, there is a reason why the explicit tag is there. to Reason Podcast. Reason. To think, understand, and form judgments by a process of logic. Hello, and welcome to Reason. Today is Sunday, February 24th, and this episode is entitled, Paul is determined to say the word obfuscate in this show. For me, it's tautological, and David, well, for David, it's poop. I'm Joshua Billingsley, along with Paul Whitmire. How you doing? And David Ward. Hi. And this podcast is coming to you live from sunny Buffalo, New York. Reason Podcast is a weekly discussion of events, current and historical, from a skeptical, rational, and non-theological perspective. Reason Podcast is brought to you by the Offensive Atheists and the Atheist Community of Buffalo and Western New York. For further information, please visit our blog and website at wnyatheist.org or email us at reason at wnyatheist.org. All right, so you know, before you delve into the the primary source journal article, I do sure. have to point out um, it, it seems, David, as though you were a little pouty in your hello. <laughs> uh, it, it seems you, you perhaps object <laughs> to uh, the fact that you are required during this episode to say the word poop. No, well, I just don't know how I'm going to work it in. I mean, uh, well, it's such a it's such a tough word to use in everyday language. It is. I, I very. We're talking about black holes. Yeah, yeah. and it it fits well into the theme of the show. The poop does. Black holes go clockwise, unless you're in Australia, just like <laughs> toilets. Yes. yes, indeed. That's, that, that's, right. that's a fact. That's a fact. All right. So, Josh, you have a primary source journal article for us to delve into here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> As, I do. Best we can. Uh, so, black holes are a son of a bitch. Um, extracting energy from black holes, the relative importance of the blandford Najek mechanism. Are you now, sure that's how it's pronounced? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. See, they have what this Blandford? Thing. <laughs> no, I'm confident Blandford is spelled that, pronounced uh, that, that way. Fine, they have this thing yeah. called paper, and and there's like letters on the paper, and they, uh, yeah, that's the best I got. Yeah, Z N A J E K. I'm saying it's a silent G or a silent Z. Silent. It's I'm definitely going... a silent G. <laughs> there's definitely a very silent. There's a silent G. G in that word. I'm not. I'm not arguing that that anything else. This is a. Uh, an interesting paper, and as I looked through volumes of uh, primary source journal articles on black holes, I came to a conclusion. What I want to do is a preface before I begin the actual article. Okay. Um, none of them actually talk about anything at all. They talk <laughs> about the most minute, obscure, teeny tiny, microscopic thing, and they analyze it to, to, to anal retentive detail. Well, that is essentially the, the sum and substance of a PhD th- th- uh, <laughs> thesis. thesis. There you go. Um, a PhD thesis is nothing more than the most tiny, minute, ridiculous, unimportant thing that nobody else has looked at because nobody else gives a shit. And I'm going to write a thing so that I'll put it in front of a group of people who will say, okay, you're now a doctor, but not really. No scalpel for you. Uh, whereas I think <laughs> astrophysicists should be able to perform back surgery. That does make sense. It requires a chisel. They don't call it a chisel, but it's a chisel. It's and a grinding chisel. stones and all sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> this uh, Wouldn't journal that work article, better for an archaeologist? Archaeolo- well, they can't, be, they can't be trifled with. Archaeologists are the most intelligent people in the history of the world. Josh has put forth this argument many times. <laughs> A series of small walls, and they can tell you which animals they sacrificed. They can tell you what gods they worshipped, their names, the name of the first bride of the second king of the third dynasty. Oh, we wore from a series of small walls. We wore pink underwear on Tuesdays. Yep, series of small walls. Archaeologists are the most intelligent. Anthropologists are the most intelligent people in the history of mankind. Not archaeologists. No, they just move rocks. Anthropologists tell you what rocks mean. Difference. Yeah, yeah, archaeologists well, would be good at drilling and, and, and... No, anthropologists also do archaeology. No, geologists are the ones who drill. Um, they basically just drill into rocks and go, hey, that's a rock. <laughs> it, it's hard on the inside, too. 
problem solved. <laughs> um, but no, the uh, this this journal article is looking at a very specific thing. Um, first, there's going to be some preliminary stuff I want to get out of the way before before we get anywhere because there's some some terminology which I found confusing, such as black holes suck. Uh, black holes do suck. Black holes suck so much. Um, black holes produce an outflow from the accretion disk. I okay. just want to say that, just throw that out there. Spinning black holes produce an outflow from the accretion disk. There's two kinds of black holes, basically. There's your spinning black holes, um, and there's your, your simple black holes. Of course. So the spinning ones spin, ah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and they produce an outflow from the accretion disk. All right, so we've got that down. Right. Um, the accretion disks are flattened astronomical objects uh, made of rapidly rotating gas which slowly spirals into a central gravity, gravity, gravitying, gravity, I don't gravitying think that's a body. <laughs> the gravitational energy of infalling matter extracted accretion disks powers stellar binaries, active galactic nuclei, protoplanetary disks, and some gamma ray bursts. Didn't, didn't you just string like 30 adjectives together? I did not string 30 adjectives together. I read 30 adjectives. <laughs> Some of those were adverbs. <laughs> That's true. Accretion disk physics is governed by nonlinear combinatorial, or excuse me, nonlinear combination of many processes, including gravity, hydronomics, viscosity, radiation, and magnetic fields. The high angular momentum of matter in an accretion disk is gradually transported outward by stresses. This allows matter to gradually spiral inward toward the center of gravity. Okay. The gravitational energy of this matter is degraded to heat. A fraction of the heat is converted into radiation, which partially escapes and cools down the accretion disk. Oh, that's uh, actually hawking radiation is what you're talking about. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, so, and now, more importantly, the Blandford, what do you call it? What do you think? Maybe it's... Znagic. Znagic? Znagic? You say Z in the end, same time? Znagic? Yeah. I think it's Jana Puppy Doo. <laughs> the Blandford Znanic uh, process is a mechanism for the extraction of energy from a rotating black hole discovered by Roger Blandford and Roman Znagic in 1977. <laughs> it's one of the best explanations for the way quasars are powered. It requires an accretion disk with a strong polar magnetic field around a spinning black hole. All right, so uh, now now that's settled. Yeah, that's now that we've got that perfectly out of the clear. Way. We're all set. Go forward. Okay. Um, basically, there's a theory that says that spinning black holes, depending on their speed, um, power uh, the uh, the uh, outflow at different rates based upon the uh, Blandford Znagic process. I'm going to call it the Jana BZ. Poppy-Doo. Call it the BZ process. There you go. All right. Um, and this has been well studied and has actually had a lot of substantiation since it was first postulated in 1977. Um, the the year is, I was born. Yes, many, many moons ago. Yeah, there were moons and stars and suns and stuff. Um, but in this paper, the uh, the authors, um, M. Livio, G.I. Oglevy, and J.E. Pringle... <laughs> 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 we shouldn't laugh at that. It's not even funny. <laughs> Crit- <laughs> <fucking prickle. laughs> Critically assess the role of the BZ mechanism in the powering of outflows from the accretion disk fed black holes. They argue that there is no reason to suppose that the magnetic field threading the central spinning black hole differs significantly in strength from the threading of the central regions of the disk. The spin, or lack thereof, of the holes is probably irrelevant to the expected electromagnetic power output from the system. I know what you're thinking. I'm on the edge of my fucking seat. (laughs) Riveted. Holy shit. What about the threading? (laughs) What about the accretion disk? Oh, my God. Spin independent magnetic fields is what we're talking about. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Um, And they're questioning whether or not this actually is the case. They put forward that the case that even if the BZ mechanism is operating, its power output is generally dominated by the electromagnetic power output of the inner regions of the disk, and for a standard thin accretion disk, the dominant power output is that due to viscous heating in the disk itself. Now, I've read this paper, (laughs) I'm going to say eight times. 
and I've got I've got green highlighter, I've got red pen, I've got yellow highlighter, and I've read eh, a lot of supporting data to try and explain this. And one thing, one conclusion I have come to is that they don't want you to know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> there is, and I, I'll, I'll say this in all seriousness, there is very little um, by way of uh, glossaries or definitions on the internet to allow you to understand this without the requisite um, academic backing. Right. I mean, you know, I, I will I will place the blame upon myself. It was my idea to do a show on black holes. Yes, and now, we'll wait till your part comes up and see what happens then. Yeah, and, <laughs> as a preface to, to my part there, I would like to share with our listening audience, um, we may in fact have gotten in a little bit over our heads on this bit. whole fucking deal. A little um, bit. So we're, we're, we're relatively learned guys. Um, we, we, we can read journal articles and we can study and stuff and, um, we, smart guys. We've read thousands of journal articles between the two of us. Thousands upon thousands. If you want to know about Plato or how a microwave, microwave works, you know, come to us. Um, black <laughs> holes, uh, turned out to be a little bit of a clusterfuck. A little bit, a little bit of a clusterfuck. Not, not too much. I and, mean, and the reason why, I think, is there seems to be a schism between the language that uh, physicists who study black holes use and reality. That actually is something that I did come across in the paper here, because um, there are quite a few concepts that they express here that can only be expressed visually. I cannot describe them yeah. without just throwing words into the microphone. I have a chalkboard. Now, what I can say is that if you uh, if you imagine um, you imagine a black hole, which is which is a space, a, a geographic location, and around it is all this stuff. There's just shit flying everywhere, sure. spinning round and round. Um, there's a certain amount of energy, which is which is just going back and forth. It's flipping and flopping, and. Uh, the the question that they're asking in the paper is, does the speed at which the black hole spins, you know, like uh, like if you took a bucket of water and you suck a you stuck a a stick in it, and you spun it around really fast, mm -hmm. the speed at which you spun it would dictate how quickly water flies out of your bucket. Like, that seems seems fairly clear. Okay, and that's been the theory for black holes. It's been the theory is that there is a direct relationship to the speed at which the black hole moves. And they're looking at the math here, and they're finding out that's not actually the case. And this paper, um, as much of a pain in the ass as it was to read, does come out with a couple of basic conclusions. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, the things we thought we knew about black holes, um, the way that they work within the universe, is probably wrong in some way. And they, they don't go so far as to, to make any predictions as to what those ways are. They do discuss um, the, the mechanisms that we have known for decades that seem to work. And this is a fairly recent paper. This paper is from uh, uh, 2008. Okay. So I mean, it's a fairly recent paper when it comes to astrophysics. I mean, the universe has been around for at least 6,000 years. <clears throat> at least. <laughs> Maybe 10. Um, so, you know... There's there's a lot of questions that are that are not answered, and since we can't really get to black holes and study them properly, let alone get away from them, um, we can't really come up with a lot of conclusions as to what they actually are. A lot of this is based on math, and it's based on uh, observation, which you know is is science. But there's a great amount of distance, and there's very little testing that can be done to do this. And what they raise in the paper is honestly as 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 stupid as it was because it doesn't actually prove or make any claims whatsoever, it does raise the question, um, have the models we've used over the last few decades actually been tested or supported, and is there a lot of substantiating evidence behind the theories? And the answer is no. This particular one, which is, again, a theory that's been around since 77, and it's very well supported. Um, they, they go through the paper um, with the, uh, the gravitational torques and the non-standard angular momentum loss. And they discuss that we actually don't have a lot of information. There are a lot of blanks that are filled in by guesses and approximations and vague relationships without solid data to back them up. And I think it's 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 revealing. Um, and again, I'll parallel this with uh, 
with religion or with any of the pseudosciences that don't adapt, these folks are deliberately saying everything we thought we knew about an area, um, which was not well studied to begin with, is wrong. We just don't know why or how. And right. I find that refreshing. Um, that's actually why I stopped on this paper. I was hoping that they would explain more why or how it was wrong um, or have, you know, a legend for what the what the information actually meant. But they don't. So I had to do a lot of research. And I will say, gotta love Scholarpedia. Well, you know, black, it, it revealed a lot of information for me. Black holes are uh, one of many uh, topics in astrophysics, in physics in general. Um, we can't see black holes. We yeah. can kind of maybe monitor the radiation that comes out of them through some particular means. We can't mm-hmm. see dark matter or dark energy, dark matter and dark energy being what composes like greater than 70% of the universe as far that's, as we can tell. That's what they seem to be saying now. Who can say? So when when we're talking about these things, we're looking at specifically the things that we cannot see, which mm-hmm. is why our, our, our guesses are just that. They're just the best guesses. So it takes, uh, you know, a, a group like this research group that you're speaking of to, mm-hmm. to come along and go, well, we've run some numbers, we've done some things, and right. we found out uh, that that guess that we made uh, doesn't seem right. Uh, we don't know what is right, but if your numbers are to fit into the equation, the equation does not balance out. And that's the best we can do because, again, we can't really monitor these things in any way. Right, and that's that's something that I find really refreshing about science is that, you know, you may have a fringe theory or you may be on the fringe in saying that a, well, a well-supported theory doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can back it up with numbers and math, you will eventually prevail or at least poke enough holes into the standard theory that somebody smarter than you will come along and produce a new theory, which seems to be what they're asking for. Yeah, they're saying that we've got we've got this fantastic evidence, but it doesn't prove any of what we said. It's all theory. It's all conjecture. It's all hypothesis. It's not, you know, it's very, very vague. So basically, it it seems like what uh, as far as I can garner from what you've described from this paper, uh, what they're saying is the the radiation that comes out of a black hole. It seems to be independent of the rotational speed of the black hole. Yes. Okay, and, and, and that, that would be significant because general physical properties tell us that it, the faster that something is rotating, the more energy it's going to be flailing off into uh, our, our uh, detectors, basically. Right, and that was the model that they had been using. I mean, that was something that we felt was generally going to be, you know, uh, that, that's something which should work no matter how big or small something is, how dense or how uh, undense. It is. <laughs> denseless. Yes, denseless. <laughs> lacking of density. Um, it is. So while we can't say anything in particular about the black hole itself in this respect, we can talk about the accretion disk on the out, along the outside, because we know that that's how your galaxies are formed. We know that, uh, although I guess apparently that's actually a subject of some other debate, they're saying that they've got, you know, galaxies that are older than the black hole in the middle of them. So who knows what's going on? Maybe makes, we don't know shit. Makes perfect sense. I believe um, the correct the term you're looking for is poop. Yeah, see, you, you, see, see, mine right at the beginning. During the introduction, when I said the word I was going to say during the show, I actually got mine out there, and I don't think anybody noticed it. So I'm going to say I think I win. Um, I, I win, and Paul cannot make this unclear or or vague in any way that would that would block that. Um, so I think uh, that's win for Josh. Win for Josh. Damn. Um, the uh, the. I'm holding it. I'm holding it. <laughs> okay. The hyperdensity of the, of the black hole makes it impossible to really know much of anything about it. We can only know the, how it reacts and how it relates to the uh, the matter around it, the energy around it. And what they're saying is that the, the density of the black hole um, may be behaving differently than anything we know of or anything that we understand, that it seems to be changing so drastically um, based upon the, the power, I'll say, input that we may have to reconsider large-scale, massive size uh, astrophysics, very, very large or very, very dense objects in the universe. Mm-hmm. It's something that we may have to consider because, truthfully, um, things all behave the same way. Yeah. Basically, down to your, uh, eh, down to once you get to about a Planck length, 
shit hits the fan. Um, and once you get about the size to a black hole, shit hits the fan. In between that, everything behaves the same. But in that, in those two, those two areas, we, we have to make new math. We have to do things totally differently because the standard theories, um, the standard, I'll call them hypotheses at this point, don't hold up as well as we would have liked them to do. Well, you know, I think black holes are, uh, you know, hopefully someone will call in or, or send an email and correct me if I'm wrong, but black holes are the only thing that I can think of that behaves so strangely on a macroscopic scale. Yeah, it's usually the tiny stuff. The, the, it's the, it's the particula- particles that just go berserk. You know, when we, when we get down to, you know, uh, 2.37 times 10 to the negative 34th mm-hmm. meters, which is the Planck length, yeah, I'm a geek. I know constants. Okay, um, when we get down to that scale, things start to behave very, very strangely. Particles behave like waves. Waves behave like particles. Right, but that's so the so building forth. block of everything. So you know, the the building blocks may be differently, but once you just you're just blowing things up, right? It shouldn't. Except with gravity, which is um, there is fucked up. We have no idea how gravity works, and and that is something that Einstein spent the last years of his life trying to figure out the grand unified theory, trying to incorporate all of the forces, the gut in in in, in the universe that we know. We're talking about the the strong and weak nuclear force, uh, magnetism, gravity, um, other stuff I can't think of, but uh, we can <laughs> we can make well said, it, sir. We can make a formula to account for all of those forces, to make them all basically uh, resolve down to Mm -hmm. being one force, except gravity. Gravity is the weird thing that we can't figure out. We don't actually know why gravity happens. We have we have an understanding of the strong and weak nuclear force. We understand that you know in in the nucleus there are there are uh, uh, neutrons and protons mm-hmm. and electrons are uh, wave functions that exist outside the nucleus, so on and so forth. We understand fusion and quantum tunneling, which is something that happens in the sun in order to create the sun. Uh, yeah, but we can't we can't rectify those. We can't make them even with gravity because. We have no fucking idea what gravity is. Yeah. There's been theories like, like gravitons was. I remember it? gravitons. That was a good yeah. time. Those were nice. I remember gravitons from when I was a kid. No. Yeah. No. It was sad. It was yeah. sad when gravitons went away. I was very sad about that. So, you know, the general principle is, uh, objects are attracted to one another. Objects that have mass are attracted to one another. Uh, and we don't know why. So that's it. <laughs> And black holes are really big masses of mass. Yeah. So that much we know. Um, the galaxy formation, we've got a pretty good idea of, but this is actually throwing a monkey wrench into that as well. The, the, the fact of the matter is, these black holes seem to be, they seem to be just, just slowly sabotaging almost our understanding of, of the universe. Mm-hmm. And again, it goes back to the fact that maybe when you reach a certain threshold of density or size, add different rules. Which is which is yeah. good, except for the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not neat, it's not clean, and that's the problem we have in science is that when things are not clean or neat, well, it it raises eyebrows with everyone because everything else matches again with gravity. Everything matches but gravity. Gravity is so a motherfucker. If everything matches until it gets super dense, well, what's the line? How dense does it have to be before all the rules break? And right. you know, it's something that we don't understand, and I find. Um, the theories that they come up with brilliant, um, and I find that when they question and, let's say, just destroy the theories, when they break the theories, mm-hmm. equally interesting, but still somewhat unfulfilling. And I, I, I wish that uh, I wish I had the uh, the uh, academic history to have just the requisite knowledge in my head to understand better what any of these mean, because it really is one of the fields that you can't learn in a week even enough to <laughs> to analyze a 10 page paper and just so you know everyone who's listening is aware yes we learn everything we talk about in a week <laughs> well in when it comes to gravity i learn every or excuse me when it comes to black holes i learn everything i know in a week i have like 15 things that i know about black holes and i know no more and didn't realize i didn't know more until i did until i did a crap load of reading and found out that there is a tremendous amount of information out there, and most of it not well supported, but being used to support other things. And it's it's a patchwork. It's a quilt of 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 patchy theory next to patchy theory next to patchy theory, and they're all interrelated, and they're all kind of right, 
but very few of them are actually, there's any level of certainty to them. And that's one of the beautiful things about science in general is that they can admit, yeah, this is a theory that we think works. It works mm-hmm. for a while. The math works uh, until you use that, and then the math doesn't work anymore. So it's obviously not right, but it's still useful. And that's the difference um, in, again, science to anything else, is that science can use things that are useful even when they know they're not right. Right. And that's how you build a better theory, a grand unified theory, or a gut well, you know, not to harp on this too much, as I will certainly harp on it more as I get to my section on black holes, but what Josh and I have found over the past week in, in kind of doing some research into black holes is there seems to be two places to look across the, 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 the information superhighway, all of the you know primary source journal articles and everything like that. There seems to be two camps that you can fall into. One camp is the camp of the actual physicists who are doing the research, such as the paper that Josh has presented here, um, which is somewhat incoherent, using uh, ill-defined terminology and phrases, and is really kind of uh, obfuscating and cloudy and unclear. Mm-hmm. And the other camp would be the kind of dumbed-down pop science version. Which is wrong. Which doesn't tell you anything. It's not revealing. So, and there's, there doesn't seem to be a bridge between those two. Um, you can either be completely incoherent, unintelligible, and mm-hmm. talk in, 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 you know, math equations, or you can say... Oh, Unsupported and unexplained math equations, which yeah. is the biggest problem that I have, is that they don't bother... There is no, there is no um, black holes for dummies. There isn't. There's no way of simplifying it. And I honestly... This is going to sound a little paranoid... I think to some degree it's to cover up the fact that a lot of the theories are not well supported. And they really don't seem to be. And again, we're talking about something that you cannot detect uh, through uh, any of the standard means we have for detecting things, Mm -hmm. whether that be uh, light, refraction, um, radio waves, things like that. I mean, we do have the concept of Hawking radiation, which may or may not be a legitimate standard for the detection of... right black holes Mm -hmm. we don't know the dude in the wheelchair said yes and we think he's smart (laughs) and he's a robot (laughs) and and the dude in the wheelchair previous to saying yes also said um there's no way that could possibly be true and he said that for 20 years yep and then he changed his mind and said yes so we we don't know um we're pretty sure black holes exist but um i am more convinced that uh that oswald shot kennedy (laughs) than black holes actually existing. Yeah, well, there's much more evidence of the existence of Oswald, Kennedy, and the bullets, along with the geographic location of all those parties at the time the shooting was supposed to take place. There's a lot of evidence that supports it in that respect, whereas with black holes, we we think that they're there, and there's a lot of stuff that makes them seem like they're there, so they're solid. The math they, works out. Right, the math works out, they're there. What are they? What? <laughs> yeah. There's something there, and it's very, very dense. Um, we've called it a black hole, so we've got a name for it, but it still does not reveal as much about the nature of black holes as I think we, um, as those interested in science, and the rest of the, the scientific community properly likes. But, you know, it's an, it's an obvious phenomena, and it's something that's studied. Do, do, and, do, 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 do. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> um, it's an obvious phenomenon. It's something that's studied Dude. that they put a lot of research into and someday may reveal any number of things about the nature of the universe, which will be beautiful. But as of right now, it reveals a lot of somewhat conflicting and contradictory data. Um, and this paper, at least, is is nice enough to, to end with a conclusion that says, eh, you know. <laughs> as, as most papers do. Well, most papers on, on, on theoretical subjects um, tend to do. Yeah. You know. But uh, that's uh, that's basically it, I think, for uh, extracting energy from black holes, the relative importance of the Blandford Znagic mechanism. Oh, yes, from the Astrophysical Journal. Yes, indeed. It was very nice. Very nice. All right. Well, if you haven't gathered thus far, we are actually talking uh, as best we can about black holes today. So, you know, please join us, call in with your questions, comments, concerns, the phone number. As we are live, call in, we'll chat with you. The number is 
9589. There's also a chat room at blogtalkradio.com, so you can go in there and um, argue with physics vegan Brian, who is probably... Uh, probably seething and, and foaming at the mouth right now. Gnawing on a pencil, yes. an organic vegetarian <laughs> pencil, <laughs> as, as, as you do. Well, who well, doesn't? Well, okay, is a vegetarian pencil not vegan? I'm just saying. Maybe they used animals to make the wood or the graphite. If I don't eat a chicken, then eggs uh, over easy with toast, <laughs> and I like cheese. And that's Logic 101 from Paul <laughs> Jedediah Whitmire. I'm a thinkerizer. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to move on to some current events, some things that are happening in the news today. Um, one of the things that I wanted to address was... Not Rob Schneider. Let's move past <laughs> that. So, uh, an article from the Christian Post. Ah, uh, the Christian Post. Good times. Uh, an article entitled, California School District is being sued for promoting religion by offering yoga classes. Okay, so... Yeah. A California school district has been sued by a family claiming that the twice-weekly yoga classes it offers are a violation of the separation between church and state. Superintendent Timothy B. Baird has said that he has not yet seen the lawsuit, but maintained that the district has the right to integrate yoga into its curriculum if it chooses. Mm -hmm. We are not teaching religion, Bard said, um, revealing that the school will continue offering the classes. We teach a very mainstream physical fitness program that happens to incorporate yoga into it. It's part of our overall wellness program. The vast majority of students and parents support it. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Yeah. Now, yoga is, yoga is, uh, uh, has aspects of a Hindu religiosity. It does. It does. And, uh. The problem is that there are sections of yoga that are strictly and wholly physical, that yes. have actual physical benefits. Um, just because the yogis originally did it does not mean that it is inherently religious, but it could be. You could be, you know, um, controlling your chi. You could be um, moving your chakras or stabilizing your any number of things that could be happening. But nonetheless, you could just be getting in positions and holding them. Well, you know, it's a little bit more complicated because the 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 Joyce J O I S Joyce Joyce Foundation mm -hmm. um, uh, is the group promoting this within the classroom. The yoga lessons are founded by the Joyce Foundation, which promotes Astinaga Yoga, established in the 20th century. Uh, through Asanaga, we can access higher levels of yoga and over time bring both the body and the mind to a state of stability and a state of peace. With consistent practice of asananas, changes become more apparent on many levels, including physical and mental. Mm -hmm. A deep sense of contentment and inner peace arises, and it is then when we can begin to more clearly understand the other seven limbs of Ashtanaga yoga. And therein is the problem. Yes. Because the, the, the limb of Ashtanaga yoga, which is you know getting into positions and holding them, stretching your muscles... Um, allowing the blood to flow through in a, in a very, in a stretched muscle is actually very good. Any number of physiological benefits that can be backed up by science and have no religi religiosity attached to them, um, is apparently the limb they should probably stop with. Any yes. other limbs, uh, you know, I love to say they keep talking about the Bible in church, in schools, and I fucking hate the Bible in schools, and blah, 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 blah. It's not the only religion. And yeah. if we're going to draw a line in the sand, we've got to be stable and we've got to be firm on the line. If you're bringing in a metaphysical concept, you violated. Simple as that. Well, if I think you wish to teach the Bible as history, there are certain portions of the Bible which um, have historical validity. Large portions of it don't because they rewrote history. God damn right. it. Jews and their, their Ramses slaves in Egypt, which never existed. But that's neither here nor there. Um, Anti-gravity devices. Yes, yes. You've got to stop watching the Discovery Channel. <laughs> I really do. Uh, I believe that was the History Channel. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You've got to stop watching TV. Just, yeah. to, just to explain to our listening audience, um, I did watch a documentary on the History Channel that said that uh, there was there was a someone with a PhD who declared that there was in no way possible that the Egyptians could have built the pyramids without some sort of anti-gravity device. Yeah. So, yeah. continuing on... <laughs> Um, 
but the, the, the level of, of religion that's put in, I mean, again, you can teach the Bible as history because it basically, the Old Testament really is the history of the Jewish people and it includes their God. Fine. Their history isn't that valid, but it's pretty valid. So, okay, you can use that. Once you start bringing the metaphysical aspects of it, um, instead of Joshua conquering Jericho, there was magic bugle that blew walls down and, and no, that's, you can't do that. Sure. And that's where the line is. Once you introduce a metaphysical concept, you, you've broken the, you've broken the line. Well, there's, Simple as that. there's the ultimate question. I mean, there's, there is no explanation in this article. Um, and I wonder what it says in the, the specific suit itself as to what is going on in these yoga classes that are being offered at a public school. Now, I, I spent a good deal of time teaching, uh, chemistry and biology at, at, it was a private school. It was a, it was a charter school mm -hmm. in Arizona. Now it was, uh, it was stocked with, uh, uh, what do you call them? With the hair and the hippies. Ah, yes. <laughs> hippie school. You taught at a hippie school, which is really funny to anyone that knows you. It really is fucking hilarious. I was the most conservative person there. And I am not a conservative in any way, shape or form, uh, as you might have gathered from this podcast. So, um, we, we had yoga classes. We had many different, uh, classes, which kind of float on the line of, Introducing metaphysical concepts into mm -hmm. children's minds. And my experience with my students was, we go to yoga. Um, we don't believe in the, the metaphysical bullshit. Right. Although we kind of do, maybe we do, I don't know, we kind of pretend. Yeah. They say stuff, we're supposed to meditate, so we meditate and we do a thing, and it's fine. I, I look at this article, um, I look at suing the California school district for offering yoga classes as, and I may be wrong here, I don't know, but it seems to be a little bit uh, of an overreaction. Um, I think it kind of makes us look like dicks. Well, here's my question. Who sued? Oh, I, I have an answer to that question. Because I'm, I'm very curious if it was, if it was uh, skeptics and, and atheists that like to sue for any old reason that you bring any kind of metaphysical concept in, or was it Christians? Well, at least according to this article, mm -hmm. there is no uh, no uh, overarching overarching affiliation attached to to this lawsuit. <laughs> uh, this lawsuit uh, was backed by Harvard educated religious studies professor Candy Gunther Brown. Ah, and um, her statement says that the classes have roots in Hindu, Buddhist, and Taoist, and metaphys metaphysical beliefs and practices and should not be promoted by the school as it constitutes support for religion. So that is uh, that is the position of Candy Gunther Brown, who, who, who instigated this lawsuit on behalf of family members, apparently. Uh, the, she claims that dozens of parents at the school oppose the program, Although only the one family uh, are named in the suit, so I I, I immediately question um, dozens of family are opposed to this. Uh, it seems a little bit questionable. Um, there, she has one one family uh, assigned to the lawsuit, which is what you need in order to file a lawsuit. And I'm right. not saying that if only one family objects, that there shouldn't be anything done about it, but. Right. I mean, Josh and I talked about this earlier in the week, and, and the question I brought up to him was, um, how many Hindu uh, students do you think there are at that school? Yeah, and I I was pretty skeptical there were any. I mean, maybe one, maybe two. Not the hugest population in this country. Um, yeah. You know, especially, and they'd probably be offended by the, uh, the teaching of yoga uh, as a purely physical thing, so they'd probably be offended the other way. If it was, if it was anything. So I think the second question is, uh, how many students do you think are going to be converted to Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism by taking this class? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's possible that while they won't be converted, mm -hmm. um, that it will, you know, let's say. Sow the seeds? Well, well no, in all honesty, it can sow the seeds or yeah. it can alter That's their perception yeah. of reality and it can lead to a more um, uh, uh, another, a different metaphysical, and I'll say again, metaphysical uh, perspective on reality, which is not supported scholastically. It's not supported academically. It's not supported intellectually or scientifically. It is, it is something which is, you know, it's more fluffy fluff. And the more fluffy fluff we have in schools, the worse. And we can point our fingers at religion, but there's, there's plenty of fluff that they teach kids at school, which is offensive to me in general. But when they do it religiously, we can we can we can get rid of it. And yeah. if that's the case, I mean, if that's what they're doing, 
they're they're selling bullshit. Yeah. Um, they're attaching it to a physical fitness program, which is you know, reasonably well supported, but they're keeping the bullshit portion of it. I'm not entirely offended by the lawsuit. Um, if you're teaching bullshit, yeah, somebody should tell you to stop. And I don't care if there were no families. If it's if it's a violation of law, it's a violation of law. Now you need right. You need a plaintiff to to commence the lawsuit, but it doesn't mean it's not wrong um, legally, even without a plaintiff. And that's sort of my problem is that you know if you let them have the uh, yogic metaphysics, well now you've got a precedent. Why not um, Jewish dietary needs? <laughs> Seriously, you know. And then instead of that, you teach the children Jewish dietary law. As, as something good. And, you know, generally it is. I mean, you know, I mean, trichinosis really isn't popular, but there used to be cases of trichinosis, which you get from pork. If you don't eat pork, no trichinosis. Therefore, you can shoehorn in other religious doctrine into this. And it, you know, it may seem like it's overreacting, but it, we've drawn a line in the sand. Yeah. You drew a line in the sand, we stick to the line. Even if it's absurd, we drew a fucking line. That's the line. You're, you're, teaching, you're teaching magic. You can't do it. Period. Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately, is the lawsuit legitimate? I would say that they do have a case uh, that this violates uh, the separation of church and state. You know, Josh and I are, are kind of at risk for falling in this trap that, oh, so many podcasts and shows about skepticism and atheism fall into, which is we spend a lot of our time, because we live in America, mm -hmm. we spend a lot of our time bashing Christians and Catholics and groups like that. Occasionally the Muslim. Occasionally the Muslim. Because, they cut off people's heads. You know, yeah, that's just, you know. They cut off people's heads. They crash planes into our fucking buildings. Um, yeah, so. Kind of dicks for that. Right. So, um, you know, we, we certainly don't spend a lot of time. Um, but the know. Hindus and the Buddhists, who can argue with Hinduism and Buddhism? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, sorry, we drew a line. Um, and, and, and I don't care how nice your religion is, it's religion. You can't do it. And I will say, I am absolutely 100%, although I'm not fucking doing it, I'm 100% pro-yoga. Yoga seems to be a, an effective exercise technique. Um, it seems to be something that helps people to, you know, stretch and relax. And I don't know anything about yoga, but it, it increases seems good. blood flow. It stretches the muscle out. It stretches the tendon. It uh, increases mobility, flexibility, something which is lost as people get older. Um, and starting at a young age is probably the best time to start any kind of practice like that because it's when your muscles and your tendons are most pliable. And so you can then make your you make people physically better. It's like gym class. Nobody likes gym yeah. class, but running is good. It, it yeah. makes you run. And and uh, let's face it, our our kids are fucking fat. Um, any any sort of physical education, any sort of exercise program that we can get our our children into is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the 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 problem with something like this is yoga comes from this religious perspective. It's an exercise technique, but it comes from this religious perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and separating those two is something that's tricky and something that we're going to have to deal with for at least the next hundred years or so uh, is, is teasing out the useful aspects, aspects of religion. I was just and, reading a very interesting book about um, old Buddhist perspectives on psychology. Okay. And they actually did come up with a lot of the things that we came up with in like the last century, mm -hmm. like hundreds of years ago. There are a lot of really interesting concepts. The problem is that they're, they're tied together with the Buddhist bullshit. So you have to pick and choose right. which things to look at, and it takes a lot of work to do that. Yoga is a, is a physical activity, so that can be good. Uh, yoga is a religion and has a, a huge quantity of metaphysics attached to it, and that's bad. But it doesn't mean that the exercise itself is bad. You've got to be able to, to parse apart the, uh, the thing, and that can be complicated. And well, it's, it's just like the Ten Commandments. I mean, four or five of those commandments are actually pretty good ideas. Yeah, i got no problem with that. Um, it's, it's the other ones. And uh, you say three, David? Yes. All right. It's three. David says three. And David is a, is a well-schooled Christian. Yes, yes, he is. I am a Christian. That's correct. Yes, yes. yes. A, a, a Christian in, in, in Rome of atheism. Yeah, okay. So that's uh, California School District sued for promoting religion by offering yoga classes. Now, I think, uh, you know, just, just to wrap this up, I think Josh and I have similar, if not identical, positions on this. I do think it's a little bit of an overreaction. Of course, I don't know what's going on in that classroom. Exactly. That's what, when it comes down to that, what actually is happening. I am concerned that uh, 
everybody fucking hates atheists. That's mm-hmm. that's ultimately my my greatest concern here is we do we are portrayed in the media at least as uh, litigious bastards, mm-hmm. and this does make us look pretty absurd. Yeah, but that's because nobody in this country realizes because we don't really care about Hindus. Um, that yoga is a religious practice. Right. And there is going to be, there are going to be a lot of leading words and metaphors that yeah. are used and they'll use the religious terminology even if they don't mean it in the religious way. So there's a very, it's, it's a delicate, delicate balance that well, has to be done in the class and it's going to be difficult. I'm sure even if they just do strictly, strictly yoga, 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 they're still talking about chakras. Yeah, fucking chakras. But what the hell kind of stupid stuff is that? Yeah. You know, chakras are just dumb. Yep. Yes, they are. Okay, so Josh, you have something more enlightening to share with us. Uh, maybe. Let's see. <laughs> what do you got? New study raises questions about religion as deterrent against criminal behavior. Oh. And this is from the Ottawa Citizens, so they're Canadians, eh? <laughs> um, and they raise the issue... Uh, well... I know that Paul and I have looked at this quite a few times. Um, I'm not sure, David, if you've if you've actually looked into this, but um, yes, the uh, the prison population is by by proclamation um, about ninety eight and a half percent religious. Yes, it right. is. They're theistic, ninety eight and a half percent or so. There might be a couple of reasons why that's the case, <laughs> um, but the uh, the general population it's about ninety six or excuse me, about ninety four percent religious um if you take in the nuns um because you've got about you've got about six percent atheists you've got about 15 percent non-religious mm-hmm. so they're atheists they're agnostics they're spiritual or whatever but they don't they don't go with any specific religious beliefs so non-doctrinal got, right they're not well even more than non-doctrinal they're Kind of lazy. I don't really yeah. fucking care. Yeah. Um, You're talking about, uh, you know, Christmas and Easter Catholics, for right. example. Well, but other Christmas. people, when you ask them, what religion are you? And they say, none. Okay. Those are the people I'm talking about. You've got about, you get yourself up to about 15% of the population. So why is it that everyone in jail is religious if religion makes you act gooder? Yes, gooder. <laughs> yes. And that's something that we've, we've talked about quite a bit. This article actually discusses more so um, religion as a... As a, as a way of, of making you a better person, recuperating you for society. And the fact of the matter is, they find uh, that's not the case. Okay. Um, the, uh, the U.S. study found that though purposeful distortion or gen- through purposeful distortion or genuine ignorance, hardcore criminals often co-opt religious doctrine to justify or further their crimes. Mm-hmm. And they discuss some numbers in here, but I think the examples are a little bit better. So... A couple of examples they chose for the article, and I'm sure they chose some of the more flamboyant ones, but uh, we'll go through them here. Um, one 33-year-old criminal, identified in the study by the nickname Trigger Man, oh, uh, good name. refused to accept the suggestion that a consequence of murder was eternal damnation. No, no, no. This is a direct quote. No, no, no. I don't think that is right. Anything can be forgiven. We live in hell now, so you can do anything in hell. God has to forgive everyone even if they don't believe in him. Oh, wow, that's really convenient. Yep, another criminal... Excuse me, I'm going to go rob a pharmacy. Yes, another criminal, 47-year-old Detroit, (laughs) um, that's that's what he says his name is, um, uh, told researchers that there is a heaven and there is a hell, but I believe that it is hell on earth and we're trying to get to heaven. We We already in hell, you know? Um... Another one here, which is a uh, young Stunna, 23-year-old criminal, says, see, if I go Who and name these people, <laughs> I think that well, it's nickname business, man. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not in the nickname business. I never had a nickname, never been good at it. You know, they used to call me JPBC because those are my initials. That's as close to a nickname as I ever got. I never understood nicknames. Um, see, if I go and rob a, well, if I go and rob a expletive, then I'm still going to heaven because, um... It's like Jesus knows I ain't have no choice, you know, he told researchers. He know I got a decent heart. He know I'm stuck in the hood and just doing what I got to do to survive. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, Jesus is a, definitely a liberal in that respect. Well, and cool, a 25-year-old criminal says. With a K or a C? C. All right. Uh, well, I don't know if they, I don't know if he said it and they wrote it down uh, or if he wrote it down. Who can say? Yeah, that's true. Um, he does a, quote, quick little prayer before committing a crime in order to stay cool with Jesus. As long as you ask for forgiveness, Jesus has to give it to you, he said. Now, this actually reminds me of a criminal I knew who ran a pawn shop okay. and smoked a lot of crack and sold guns to people illegally and any number of other things. Uh, very nice guy. Very nice guy. Um, not really a, a, a legal guy. But I was talking to him the one day, and I, you know, I noticed he's got all over his house you know, the crosses, and he's got the Bible. And I'm like, well... What's the deal, man? You, you you sell guns to people that are going to shoot people. You smoke crack. I saw you, you know, you got a lot of trouble for beating the crap out of somebody that didn't pay you on time. Doesn't it seem, you know, sinful? I mean, I'm no Christian, <laughs> but it seems like you're kind of an asshole. And he says, no, because as long as you ask for forgiveness, you go to heaven. Oh, Period. yeah. No matter what you do, ask for forgiveness, go to heaven. Problem solved. So, Just don't die in the middle of, you know... Gang raping some hookers for blow. Right. As long as you don't die in the middle of it and you get a chance to ask for forgiveness, you're all good. No, no, you see, these people are, they're uh, circumventing that by asking for forgiveness before they do it. Well, cool certainly is. Cool, yeah, he's, he's got it made. Yeah. Um, well, you know, this has been talked about a whole number of times on the, uh, the Facebook and a number of different places, but anyone who's familiar with the atheist experience, um, mm -hmm. there was an episode uh, probably about a month ago. Uh, Tracy Harris is one of the, the co-hosts of the show, and a caller basically called in with a bunch of bullshit, batshit craziness. Um, but Tracy Harris made the point of, if I were a god, if I were all-powerful and all-controlling and all-knowing and all of that, I think... Uh, it would be a better plan to stop people from raping children as opposed to forgiving them for raping children after they were done raping children. Yeah, that seems like that would, if I were an all-powerful being, eh, might be the way I'd do it. I'd do it in a different order. Yeah. I'd yeah. prevent the, you know, the horrible act you know, from commencing. The whole Catholic and Christian loophole of, well, you just have to... Uh, be honestly after asking for forgiveness afterwards and everything's all fine uh, creates a, a problem here or there with the system. Um, yeah. when, when you consider that Hitler could have been like, yeah, sorry about that whole Jew thing. Um, <laughs> my bad. Um, well, once, you, once you've already set yourself on fire, if you ask for forgiveness, then you're asking for forgiveness for the suicide too. Oh yeah. Problem mm -hmm. solved. Yes, yes, yes. Then, so, so that so Hitler, Gets to go to heaven if he asks for it. That's what I think. Yeah. According to Christianity. It's going to be me and, and Hitler and, and, and St. Peter's hanging out in heaven, uh, playing times. bocce ball, apparently. Uh, that's, as I understand, what they do in heaven. But that's basically been my problem for a long time, is that people use, and uh, you can convince people to do anything for you, or anything, if God's on their side. You can, you can kill, rape, the murder, thing. slaughter, and you read the Old Testament... And, oh, my God, they did such horrible things. But they did mm -hmm. them for God. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. So once you've got this 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 external morality that you can manipulate and change and alter to suit your purposes, once that exists, once you've got that, um, you then are justified in whatever horrible act you want to commence in. Yeah. And that's the problem with that. And I, I, I assume some people internalize the morality very nicely and it works well for them. They get into the habit of being good simply because it's good. That's fine. Um, I think those people probably would have been good anyway. Right. Um, and I think the people that are not going to internalize this, the, the morality they're being taught by the church, were probably not going to be moral anyway. They're probably bad people. There's bad wiring. Simple as that. A horrible event happened to them in their childhood, or maybe they just don't fucking care. It doesn't matter. I don't think that religion, it's a nice tool, I guess, with parables and shit, but I don't think it's actually any more useful in making people better people. Right. Um, internaling, internalizing morality, teaching people empathy seems more like a better way to make better people. Um, empathy as opposed to, you know, you know, the threat of damnation and being good only because God's watching you. Well, you know, Josh and I have talked about this. We're not too sure about David and his position. Who can say? But, uh, to quote a, another famous celebrity, um, Penn Jillette said something that has kind of stuck with me, which is, uh, he, he stated that as an atheist, he rapes exactly as many babies as he wants to. And that number just happens to be zero. Right, because 
That's always been my problem. They say to you, well, where do you get your morals from? Why don't you just rape people? Not just kill people. You can do it. And I'm I like, don't want to rape well, people. I could, but, you know, so could you. I mean, I don't, I don't really want to. That's not really my style. Seems like a bit of a dick move. You know, that's yeah. all I'm saying. You seem like an asshole. Uh, you know, you beat somebody to death with a stick. Uh, maybe you're just an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not that you're not moral. It, you, you're just fucking broken. Yeah, again, I beat as many people to death with a stick as I want to. Um, this, this cat's annoying the fuck out of me, but besides Cappy, you know, uh, yeah. I think most people are safe. So, I, you know, in conclusion, most? well, you have been walking I, a fine I, line, I motherfucker. You've been walking for you. a fine line. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hit record? Okay. So, um, you know, just to, to, to bring this back to the, the idea of there being a, a greater percentage of people in prisons who are religious, mm-hmm. I would have to say, um, if I ever do go to prison for uh, hitting somebody with a stick until they're dead and then raping them or something mm-hmm. like that, which, uh, again, I don't think I'm going to do, but who can say what the future holds? Exactly. Um, but you, know, you never know. Don't make any proclamations about the future. Uh, if I do go to prison, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a Christian. No, these are self-assessment, and they're, they're, they're completely... Uh the the surveys they do they're completely anonymous okay so i mean it's not like when you go to there yeah yeah you go to see the chaplain you know like in clockwork orange um where he goes to see the chaplain because he likes to read the bible about all the raping and murdering he mm-hmm. thinks that's cool um so of course you go see the chaplain you act all religious you do those sorts of things externally but in the anonymous survey you get to say whatever you want so it probably t- tweaks the numbers a little bit but you know still it seems to me that most people that are staunchly religious um, are not well educated. The more education you have, the more likely you are to be an atheist, and that's also backed up statistically. Um, so they're probably not that smart, and people that get involved in crime are usually not well educated. They don't have many other options in the world other than crime. So my my belief is that religion keeps people stupid, and religion which keeps people stupid um, also allows them to you know just do horrible horrible things. So I don't think it's necessarily the religion that does it. I think they're both symptoms of a lack of education and a lack of understanding about the the greater world in and of itself. Yeah. All right. Well, what was the uh, the title of your article there? That's a fine question. <laughs> in some place in the, the, the myriad of papers piled on your desk. New study raises questions about religion as deterrent against criminal behavior. All right. Well, David is going to uh, share with us some uh, some more fun times from the church the, time with David, the land of holy holiness and stuff like that. And just in case you were wondering, he's 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 doing this goatee thing he's got going on. Um, Makes right? you look like the devil. I, I'm not really sure if I'm pro or anti, but I don't know. I, it, I'm a it, computer geek. Computer geeks have goatees? Always, yes. Oh, I, I didn't know there was a rule. I apologize. Yes. See, that's why you're not a computer geek. I am a something. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I you like are. potatoes. <laughs> well said, sir. Well said. Eloquent as always. All right, David. David. Church time with David. What do you got? All right. Well, uh, this was not planned, but uh, your uh, your article, Josh, actually somewhat has to do with what they really? talked about in church today. Yes. I like incorporating things. Connectivity. It's synergy. That's right. Uh, the subject was... Uh, the whole faith, not or you know, salvation by faith as opposed to works. Yeah. Okay. So, by uh, as he as we were talking about uh, in the Christian religion, at least the the current one we are dealing with now, uh, generally, uh, in order to get into heaven, you just have to believe in Jesus, and what you do does not matter. Right. The Protestants, the Catholics, still believe in works. It's faith and works. Whereas the Protestants, it's just faith, and we assume. If you've got the faith, you will do good works, but that's not the requirement. The requirement is the faith, which leads you to do good works. Right. Catholics require the works. Like right. George Michael. Yeah, and you've got to have it. Okay. I did not realize that Catholics did, uh, Yeah, faith plus works. works. Oh, oh yeah. It was actually one of the big things the Protestants came about with. They were saying, um, you shouldn't have to do good works. You believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you will do good works. That's simple as that. So proof that you do good work, proof that you believe in Jesus is that you do good works. Yeah, Christians, uh, you know, Protestants are actually much more deterministic on that aspect of, like, well, as long as you believe wholeheartedly in Jesus, Jesus will guide your hand, and Mm -hmm. you can do no wrong. Which 
kind of creates a problem when you're uh, batshit crazy and think that uh, cutting people up and cooking them and eating them is a good thing, mm-hmm. um, like and then, Jeffrey Dahmer. And then ask Jesus to forgive you. Well, you don't even need to ask Jesus well, to Jesus forgive you. If Jesus wants you to do it, you're all good. Jesus <laughs> guided your hand mm-hmm. as you ah. held the, the, the cleaver. Ah. So, yes. But go on. I'm sorry. We interrupted. That's all right. Well, I actually looked up s- uh, some verses regarding this. Um, really? Good yes. for you. Well, <laughs> Doing the research. That's right. Uh, so there are some for salvation by just grace, and then there are some that are sal- uh, for salvation by works mm-hmm. and not by faith alone. So by both. So so there's yes. an argument for either side. Right. All right. Except one is contradicting the other. We're talking about religion. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> if, yeah, it's, yeah. if it's not self-contradicting, it's probably not religion. <laughs> I just, three heads, a leg made of bronze. I, I Brass. Can go on. Bronze, brass. brass, brass. I, I think it, was it bronze? The other one's made of lead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Whatever. So. Doesn't matter. All right. So uh, we have three for saved by grace. So the first one is Ephesians chapter two verses eight through nine. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Mm-hmm. Then not not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. So here we have uh, uh, a verse saying that it doesn't matter what you do, you just need to uh, believe in God and he will give you grace and send you to heaven. Mm-hmm. That and makes then, sense. So now we also have a, a, a contradictory verse, James 2, chapter or verse, chapter 2, verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Mm-hmm. That does seem contradictory, but I will this say... This is all in the same Bible. <laughs> yes. yes. But I will say... And they're like one book away from read that. Other. Read that last one again. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Who, who is speaking there? I know. That was what I was curious about. So I got the whole chapter. Mm-hmm. And if you read a couple of verses prior to it, uh, leading up to it, from verse 20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him by his righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Okay, I do have to to stop. Okay. Um, I actually don't think that is... And I, I do like the game of apologetics. It's a fun game for me. I like. I to know do you it. do. So um, this would be interesting. <laughs> um, I don't think that they're necessarily as contradictory as they appear. I think they fall into the Protestant I perspective, right. which is that um, while you are not judged by God on faith or on works, if you are a true believer and follower of Jesus El Christos, um, you will in turn do good faith. So I, who cannot see your David soul... I cannot see your soul or your action or tell what your faith is. I can, in fact, by which is evidenced by your works. So much like the black hole we can't see, we can see what happens around it. See how I tied that back in there? Oh, nice. (laughs) You can see what happens around it. So by that, I can deduce that there is a black hole. I can't see the black hole. The I black, black hole being there. David's faith. <laughs> yes. You like that? That's a, that's a double. Um, you can't see it, mm. but you can see how it interacts with the world, so we can then judge the size of the black hole or the amount of faith, the amount of goodness, and the amount of, of glory unto God that you present by your acts in the world. So we can see and we can judge you culturally by your acts, which reveal your faith, though we can't see your faith, we can see how how God probably sees you by the faith that you have as evidenced in your acts. Right. So I, I just have one question for yeah. you. Um, I thought that's pretty good. I was very happy with that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. impressed. Uh, props to Josh. I, I I want to know if you are aware that when in 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 your 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 monologue there, your, yeah. your diatribe. Yeah, um, that was nice. When you said the word God, were mm-hmm. you cognizant of the fact that you were saying it in a Christopher Walken impression? I was not. I was not, but I've been working on my Christopher Walken, so that's that's nice. Thank you, thank you. So I, just one word. Just, God. And that's yeah. I can't well, that's do how it. Christopher Walken would say God. I'm confident. So I, I think I think that's good. I so, thought that was how John Travolta said God. I'm pretty sure John Travolta is doing a Christopher Walken impression oh, badly. Oh, oh okay. John okay, Travolta says, is, "Oh my God," <laughs> as opposed to "Oh my God." Yeah, see, which is Christopher the, Walken. <laughs> um, so I, I think that clarifies that. Now, was this the sermon today? Was this no. a sermon? 
Okay. The ser- well, yes, the sermon today was regarding uh, faith by or, uh, grace, salvation by faith. Okay. Uh, but he didn't go into the contradictions. Or so you, you took it up and you looked it up and you found these. Now, do you think that I'm sound? Do you think that my logic is solid? Because it is basically one, one of the things. There's indulgences. Um, there's the Pope. And there's, you know, faith. Um, there's, there's salvation by acts. Those are basically three things that the Protestants said, un minut in bitzer. Um, and that was what spawned them to spin off and form their own party down the street. Um, do you think that's a sufficient argument? Because I think my argument is good, but it's not. I mean, it's not solid. Well, it's right. not perfect. I think your argument is sufficient. However, it's not used. And the reason why it's not used is because, as you have pointed out many times to me, uh, Protestantism is is an umbrella term for a number of different uh, religions that have broken. Episcopalian, I believe the terminology is crap load. Episcopalian, Baptist, um, uh, uh, Calvinist, uh, Wesleyan, Pentecostals, Pentecostals, Seventh Day Adventists, and all all Lutherans. The, all of these different denominations have different perspectives on determinism, which I think ultimately this is what is leading it, what this is leading back to is. Um, the idea of having faith in in God and Jesus Christ, and mm-hmm. that faith being the guiding hand that would control you to do good deeds and good works, that would so, lead you to not control you to free will, lead you to. Mm-hmm. Well, it's 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 a more deterministic aspect. Um, if if your particular branch of Protestantism believes in determinism, I don't believe it's deterministic. Okay, I believe it's more of a God's eye view. A God's eye view is going to seem deterministic a lot of the time, but it's not necessarily deterministic because, again, as the argument you and I have had in the past. I would argue that um, God would live, and here's me doing more apologetics, and anybody listening who hasn't listened before, I, I am an atheist, um, just so <laughs> you know. Um, if I were to argue, I would say that a God's eye view would view the present currently, certainly just the way it is, but also views every present. So God will know what you will do in the future, even though it's not really determined yet because God is outside of time. So God would be would be aware of this information both globally in, in 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 totality, but then individually in the moment would know what's happening now and would then be able to act, you know, with with your Moses or your Noah, interact with them at the time, um, as though he did not know what the future held. So I don't think that it's necessarily deterministic in and of itself. Um, it still allows for free will and for free action. It just you know. God knows what's going to happen. It's not predetermined because you're acting out right now what's going to happen. All right. Well, I'm he, just saying. He, here's the thing. Um, at some point, when when Josh and I have, uh, you know, I would say a long vacation coming up, we're yeah. going to have a 14 hour podcast where we uh, put forth our positions on time travel, which are dramatically different. Yes, that's actually the first time that Paul and I got into. An argument that we could not end. Yeah, mm. um, and and by could not end, if you've ever listened to the show, you can imagine this thing went on for about three months. <laughs> it did. It died down a little bit, then came back, then died down, then came back. Every time we saw each other, we consi- consistently were, held the same argument. New examples for the argument. There were diagrams and charts and, oh, yes. and whiteboards and, oh my God. And he's not kidding. We, we, had, we had diagrams and charts and whiteboards because neither of us believes in time travel. <laughs> Let's say time travel existed. Here's how it could don't, don't work. Even, don't even, and that even. was the blah blah blah. And then it went on. And, and so you know, we also argued quite a long time about um, the uh, duality of the nature of God in time and acting in the universe. And right. again, both of us staunch atheists. So you know, it's well, nice to argue about hypotheticals. Well, your God outside of time is a is a clever fix, um, but it is basically the same argument. That uh, creationists use, which is, you know, uh, there's nothing cannot, uh, something cannot come from nothing. It's so not even close must be a to God. creation ex it nilo. It really is. It's not. It's simply describing the nature of a being, which would be beyond our comprehension, a way to comprehend in turn what this being would be. You know, that that's all it is. It's, it's, it's straightforward, simple stuff. Wham, bam, thank you, Sam. I don't think it's complicated. I think it's a fantastic piece of apologetics, and I'm surprised people don't use it more often. All I mean, right. well, I came up with it on my own, but I'm sure there's there's some kind of some kind of Christian apologist out there that's that's singing the singing the praises of a, a dual existence, the nature of God being both in and outside of time, allowing him to interact with the universe and yet still have a global perspective on all reality. 
All right. Well, if you think Josh is right on this position, then uh, you're an idiot. And if you think I'm right, then go ahead and email reason at WNYAtheist.org, and I will mail you a cookie for agreeing with me. Now, understand... I, what I mean is the essence of a cookie, the soul of a cookie, um, the the actual, you know, you know, the non corporeal part of the cookie in a non corporeal envelope through the non corporeal postal service. Well, right, stamps okay, are expensive. Okay. Right, so good deal. <laughs> All right, uh, David, did you have anything else on your uh, on your uh, well, biblical well, contradiction? Well, there there was a second verse. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do I'm we sorry, go, man. Do I'm we want to go over it? Uh, let very, very quickly. We'll, okay. we'll run through it. I promise. I will not. Uh, no diatribes. Well, I, I, I definitely. I, for the first one regarding your argument, I had already somewhat thought of. I, I didn't think about through as much as you had, but uh, yeah, I had already thought of the fact that it's. It, so you're agreeing with him for the first one, yes. Yeah. Neener, so neener, easily, neener. You're you can a easily head who's not getting any cookies. You're. You can. Damn it! Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> See. Yes, yes threat can, of non-corporeal you can, cookie lacking. You can push that one aside with, okay. with Josh's argument, but the second one actually comes from El Christos. El Christos himself. Yes. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> so the verse is uh, Matthew verse or chapter nineteen, verses sixteen and seventeen. And behold, one came to him and said, "Teacher, what good shall I do that I may a- obtain eternal life?" And so he, meaning Jesus, said to him, "Why are you asking me about what is good?" There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. As well, a general rule of thumb, keep the commandments, and I don't think it necessarily would apply to just the ten. I'm going to say it applies to all 613 right. commandments that yes. Jesus supposed Which to means support. all Christians are fucked. Well, yeah, that's for goddamn sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and especially the ones that bear false witness, which is one of the big ten. But that's neither here nor there. I still don't think it's, I don't think it's perfectly solid, and I think a good apologist... Could could fight probably, you on that one, and and I probably. think that this is a good example of if you go ahead and read the four gospels, uh-huh. you'll you'll notice that Jesus doesn't fucking say anything. <laughs> yeah. Like seriously, um, um, it, it, the whole thing about render onto God what is God's and render onto Caesar, Caesar what is Caesar's, Caesar's yes. was just a, a cop out for not answering the question about. Taxation. Yeah, he he doesn't answer questions a lot. No, a lot of that's blah blah boo, and I'm gone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like a politician, like the king of the Jews, very uh-huh. much like a politician. There's 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 not a a staunch and solid answer in any of the four gospels. Well, you can't nail him down. No, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I said nothing. Nothing. You can't nail him down. Come on. And However, I, it took you me can a nail second. him up. You can nail him up, but not down. Sorry. However, I do think your uh, someone could construe your argument as an as a uh, as a uh, uh, no true Scotsman. Somewhat, actually, they it would could, have to be. Well, actually, actually, the problem with my argument is that it does. It has to be a no, a no true Scotsman yeah. argu- argument. Well, but yeah. the problem is that um, in this particular instance, faith is not well, no. measurable. <laughs> well, no, faith is measurable by God alone. Right. Therefore, it can be a no true Scotsman. Because God would know if you were truly a Christian. Yeah. So while I can't judge you, um, God, well, who would know your... Well, except the people that... What the <laughs> fuck? Fucking Christians judge everybody. Um, that God would know um, the level of faith. Like, you have, like, you yeah. know, he's got, like, a beaker, and he's, like, pours it in there, says, nope, Ooh, color three liquid. milliliters, not enough, you're off to hell. Fuck. You know, so God would know. Right. Um, so while we cannot, which is probably the reason that you're not supposed to judge, is that we would not necessarily know. We wouldn't be able to... To you know, grasp what it is, we'd grasp at the straws that we have, and the straws that we would have would be the works. So we'd say, well, I think Bob is probably pretty faithful because he does a lot of good stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, he seems to be one of the faith and and the follower of 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 old JC, and he seems pretty cool with that because he does all this good shit. Um, so I think he's he's got the faith, but I couldn't tell. Um, only God could tell, and that would be the argument. I think that's why. Um, the argument, and I'm going to say, defeats the no true, no true Scotsman uh, argument because you know there is somebody that would know if he was a true Scotsman based upon the evidence that they have, even though we don't have it. That's a legitimate point. Okay, okay. I would have to say I think we really need to change the name of no true Scotsman to no true walrus. I just think it's a better name. I actually have no problem with that. No true walrus would, you know, eat caviar. Yes, I think actually they probably would. Wait. 
No well, true the, walrus would fly. No true walrus would fly. So if you see something flying, not a true walrus, no matter how much he proclaims, I'm a walrus. No true walrus would imbibe of a shamrock shake from McDonald's. Uh-huh. Yes, that I, I actually would agree. I would agree. They're tusks. They couldn't get into the styrofoam cup. Well, no, there's a straw. Walruses can't use a straw. Don't be ridiculous. Well, all, all right. Your skepticism about, about walrus straw use leads me to question a lot of your conclusions, my friend. <laughs> well, uh, Josh and I have an announcement to make. We're, we're still fleshing out the details and figuring out how this, how this is all going to work. But however it's going to work, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to vomit at the end of it. I'm confident. So last, it's, it's Easter tradition. Yeah, last, last Easter, I had the uh, distinct pleasure of eating a Cadbury cream egg, which I had never had on the air. And we had the pleasure of discussing it in graphic detail while you were disgusted by the horror of I'm it. I'm gagging now. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so so this Easter, we're going to raise the stakes. Oh, we're up in the we're, ante. We're taking it a step further. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, so this Easter, um, all of you listeners will will be privy to a contest between Josh and I. Now, Josh believes... Uh, Josh knows. I, I I don't know why he has such confidence in himself, but you know we'll, the day will come. Josh believes that he can put more peeps into his mouth than I can. So yes, again with the the highbrow intellectualism mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, highbrow humor that you come to expect from Reason Podcast uh, for our Easter episode, we will uh, we will be having a little bit of a contest. We'll have David judge because. Our mouths will probably be full. Yes, he will be. He will be our 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 juror, and he will decide. He will be the judge, and he will be the referee to to I, say which one of us, either Paul or myself, which one of us can put the most peeps in our mouth at a time. And I think mm-hmm. that show is going to go something like that. Peeps not all the way in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm think, confident that it will. I think <laughs> I'm going to have to practice being an auctioneer. Yes. <laughs> Add one peep, one peep. Paul's got peep, Paul's got peep, Paul's got two peeps. Paul's got two peeps. Paul's got Josh got a peep, Josh got two peeps, Paul's got three peeps, three peeps, four, four peeps. Paul's got... Uh, yes, yes, that's what we're going to do. So you're going to have to practice that. You're going to have to get it going, and it's going to have to be good. All right. So um, we will be back shortly with our discussion on black holes. Do you have questions, comments, concerns, or random musings? Email us at reason at wnyatheist.org. Out of boredom, you should check us out on Twitter and follow at Reason Podcast. We appreciate it when folks retweet us because it makes us feel smart and important. Listen live Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern on blogtalkradio.com. Call in, join the conversation at 424-243-9589. Can't listen live on Sundays because you're too busy praying to whatever gods you believe in? We are also on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and you can download the show from wnyatheist.org slash reason dot php find us on facebook at reason podcast and go ahead and like us we'll take your liking us as loving us and that will sufficiently satisfy our egos we know you're out there we know you're listening and we appreciate it more than these words can say hello and welcome back now for the second half of the show paul is going to give us just i'm sure a comprehensive an in-depth analysis explaining in anal retentive and and completely expressive and clear detail everything we've ever wanted to know about black holes. Now that I've set the bar reasonably low, I'm sure there's no problem with you matching it, especially considering that the introduction to the show was that we don't know anything about black holes. So, Paul, take it from here. I'm just going (laughs) to reinforce the fact that I am going to say a bunch of shit that I have no idea what the fuck I'm saying. Okay. But before that, I would like to take issue with the fact that this stupid-ass podcast that we do interrupted a perfectly good conversation that we were having during the commercial break. (laughs) Yes, yes, it did. But, you know, time is what it is, man. We all all bow down to the, the ticking time bomb that is life. I'm not a slave to your clock. I don't even have pants on. You're, you're wearing pants, and you did just come back to the podcast literally on time, the way it had to be. We had to stop our conversation. So yes, you are, and <laughs> yes, you are. God damn it. <laughs> All right, black holes. So um, just again, I, I, I need to point out that the black holes are not 
uh, you know, when, when we chose this topic, uh, there there are many interesting facets of black holes that mm-hmm. we're going to try and discuss some of the more interesting ones here. But the the problem is ultimately, uh, I don't have a chalkboard. I don't have anything behind me. I don't have the ability to explain using numbers and graphs and and, and pictograms and things like that. So we're going to do the best we can. I like pictograms. But uh, the the common assumption about what a black hole is is just that it's that it is a hole. It's, uh, well, as a chemist, a philosopher, and an ex-Christian are here to tell you, um, that is not the case. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are definitely professionals in this area. Black holes <laughs> are not holes, they're not tubes, they're not really anything of the sort. They're simply really dense pockets of matter. Okay, so Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton figured out that every point mass in the universe attracts every other point mass with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now, that is the universal gravitational formula. Right. Basically, it just means that no matter what there is, whether it, we're talking about myself, um, the, the glass that's on my desk here, any every single object made of matter, made of mass in the universe is attracted to every other object in the universe. And the, the force at which they're attracted by is, is directly proportional to how much they weigh and inversely proportional to the distance between them, meaning the closer they are, the stronger the gravitational force is. Right. Now, we have never come to any understanding as to why this is the case. Um, again, we, we were talking about this before with all of the all of the the fundamental forces that exist in nature, um, gravitation is one that we we don't quite get. It's not it's not because of electrons or protons or anything like that. It's not a magnetic attraction. It's not a nuclear attraction. Um, it it doesn't seem to have an answer as to why things should want to be closer to other things. Right. We can explain what it does. Yeah. We just have no idea why. And there have been, like you said before, there have been a lot of theories, but none particularly good and none well supported. Right, right. So Newton developed this theory of gravity, which, you know, good job, Newton. Apple fell and he created a a whole paradigm for us understanding the universe. And I'm confident that story actually happened. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So uh, the next step required in order to get to black holes is a matter of some contention amongst uh, Reason Podcast listeners. Um, if every point mass in the universe is attracted to every other point mass, then we need to talk about photons. Yeah. Are photons attracted to mass, uh, i.e., do photons have mass? That's the question. And when it comes to black holes, there uh, seems to be an answer-ish? Uh, sort of. And that's the problem. Now, there's 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 a complication between uh, resting mass and moving mass, and no matter what I say at this point, I'm going to be yelled at by both physics vegan Brian and the other Paul, um, who who disagree with me, saying that photons do not have mass, which would be upsetting if it weren't for the fact that they are wrong. So, you see, there was this guy, um, uh, his name was Albert Einstein, and we uh, we all remember his famous quote, uh, look at my head, my hair is fucking crazy. No, no, um, there are two things in the universe that are infinite, um, and one of them is stupidity, right? That's, mm. that's, his, that's his quote. That's the one you're talking about? Look at my hair, it's fucking crazy. That too, that too. <laughs> okay, he also declared that photons have mass and therefore are affected by gravity. So, one of the things that we can do with uh, this this complicated system is is to boil it down we 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 exist in a universe that has three observable dimensions now a lot of people like to throw time in there and call time a dimension that's a it's a load of crap it's a load of crap basically so we we have you know uh, up down left right and forward and back we have three dimensions we have cartesian coordinates if you mm-hmm. remember anything from geometry class descartes the philosopher yes so one of the ways that we can better understand how the universe works is to boil it down to two dimensions as opposed to three. There's a, there's a book written in the 70s called Flatland, where, they, where the author created this whole universe of two-dimensional beings. Mm-hmm. Um, there were squares and triangles and rectangles and things like that. And the, 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 the big moment in the book was that a cone, a three-dimensional object, passed through their two-dimensional plane, and they were freaked the fuck out. Because as the cone passed through, 
from their perspective, being that they could only see and exist in two dimensions, the, the cone started off as a tiny dot mm-hmm. that appeared out of nowhere and got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as the cone was going through their two-dimensional plane and then disappeared. So this is, you know, analogous to we exist in three dimensions. If we were to, uh, you know, uh, teleport, sure. you know, in the Star Trekian sense... Um, then then that would be basically the same thing. We would appear out of nowhere, um, and then we would disappear, and so on and so forth. But so, looking at the universe in two dimensions, um, imagine a blanket floating on top of a pool of water. Now, imagine taking a rock and dropping that rock in the middle of the blanket. It would curve down. It would sure. basically create a funnel around there. Now, that that is exactly what's happening with black holes. The the mass that is thrown into the pool is so dense that it's curving space-time in a fourth dimension that we can't actually perceive. So if you think about the two-dimensional blanket and how that curves down into a funnel, black holes are doing the same thing except in four dimensions. Right. So you, you can't visualize that. If you go back to the blanket, which was a 2D analog, you realize that in order to visualize it, you need to imagine the curving in a third dimension. If the blanket is only two-dimensional, you know, we go up and down and left and right, um, you can't even perceive the curving unless you have the ability to realize that a third dimension, a third axis is, is existing, that the rock is actually pulling down on the blanket and creating a curve, which folds in. So that's going from two dimensions to three dimensions. Mm-hmm. We can't go from three dimensions to four dimensions. Our brains don't seem to be able to do this. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's somebody that could find a way to explain it at some point in some way that might make sense, but it seems like gibberish. I mean, it's we, we live in a universe of three dimensions, therefore you can't easily understand a, right. a an additional dimension. It doesn't make any sense. Well, ultimately, you know, there is this question in, in neurology and neurobiology as to whether or not we even could at any point right. comprehend four dimensions. Uh, now, comprehension is a tricky thought, yeah. especially for neurobiologists. If anyone's ever seen a, a, a CAT scan or a CT scan, a computer, computerized actual tomographic scan, basically an x-ray that takes slices of your body, um, if you imagine that the doctor can look at the various slices of your body, if the doctor could visualize all of those slices at once, mm-hmm. that would be seeing in the four dimensions. That would be, so, so you, you have, you know, a slice every 30 millimeters, which is what they usually do for a CAT scan. So you see a, a cross section of what it looks like in your lungs, what it looks like a little below that, what it looks like in your diaphragm, so on and so forth. If you could imagine all of those slices at the same time, you would be approaching a perspective. Wouldn't that a, just be seeing somebody invisible? Or somebody that was, that was, uh, that was clear translucent? No, no, it wouldn't be because the, the information for each slice is more detailed than you would get. Uh, it, 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 uh, yes, uh, no, I mean... I, I, I'm, I'm, call, gonna... I'm half calling shenanigans on that because I see where you're going and I understand it's difficult. Again, presenting the fourth dimension is difficult and it has to be done through metaphor. Um, it's just that to some, de- to some degree that's going to be true, but I think it's still going to be, as, as, a, as a useful metaphor, it's still going to be limited. Yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately, there's, there's no good way for me to yeah. describe the fourth dimension. Right. I, or if you want to include time, the fifth dimension, or however you want to do it. I mean, superstring theory uh, postulated that there are 21 clockwise, clockwise rotating dimensions. We're not even going to fucking get into that, because that's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> so let's instead, let's talk about a little bit of the history of black holes. Now, uh, black holes, of the, the concept, the idea has been around for a while. Let's go back to 1783. Um, John Mitchell in 1783 stated that if the semi-diameter of a sphere of the same density of the sun were to exceed that of the sun in proportion to 500 to 1, a body falling from an infinite height towards it would have acquired at its surface greater velocity than that of light, and consequently, supposing light to be attracted by the same force in in proportion to its inertia, with other bodies, all light emitted from such a body would be made to return towards it by its own proper gravity. So this is in 1783, and this guy, John Mitchell, is hypothesizing exactly what we're talking about. What mm-hmm. if you had a piece of matter that was so dense that the, the gravitational field from that piece of matter was so significant that not even photons from light could escape it? That is pretty heady thinking for 1783, 
Uh, yeah. But that was the, what they call the age of enlightenment and the scientific revolution. A lot of heavy thinking. Yeah. A lot yeah. of heavy thinking. So, you know, it was a good guess, but it took Einstein in, uh, you know, Einstein, that guy with the crazy hair, in 1916 with his theory of general relativity, otherwise known as the geometric theory of gravitation. Mm -hmm. And by otherwise known, I mean known by me and like three physicists, and that's it. So, but yeah, the geometric theory of gravitation. Um, Einstein provided the math behind (laughs) gravity being a property of space-time, and the math behind photons being affected by gravity. So this kind of set the stage for black holes, this this idea that we could have a piece of matter that was so dense, that had such a gravitational field, that it would pull everything n- near it into itself. And everything included not only photons, but it also included the very fabric of space-time. Now, what does that mean? I can't do any better in explaining what that means than to go back to the blanket and the rock and the blanket. Like, you're just talking about curving the blanket down. That's it. It's, it's, it's taking the entire framework of the universe and collapsing it in on itself. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, fine, I guess. So, this, (laughs) this set the stage, um, it required a little bit more thinkerizing. And it is at this point that I'd like to point out that my Microsoft Word does not think that thinkerizing is a word. I I think your Microsoft Word is is sorely mistaken. I'm very upset about this. I'm going to write Bill and Melinda Gates. You should. You should. Bill, what the fuck? (laughs) Okay, so in 1931, I'm going to do the best I can, Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Very um, nice. I like the last ah, name. That flows. Chandrasekhar is fine, because he's one of the guys from Broken Lizard who who did Super Troopers. But mm-hmm. besides that, the Subramanian um, Chandrasekhar calculated using special relativity, the theory that Einstein actually came up with 11 years before he came up with general relativity, mm-hmm. came up with it in 1905. But he calculated using special relativity that a non-rotating body of electron degenerate matter above a certain limiting mass now called the Chandrasekhar limit at 1.4 solar masses has no stable solutions. So let me let me let me translate that. Please as do best I can. Um, this kind of goes back to some of the things that you were talking about with the rotation of, of black holes. Um, but what Chandrasekhar figured out is that what what he means by electron degenerate matter is that the the gravitational field of the matter was so intense that the normal structure, the normal atomic structure that we understand to exist, like protons and neutrons and the nucleus of an atom and Mm -hmm. electrons uh, as wave functions or as particles spinning around the outside, um, that kind of collapses. Um, The gravitational field is so strong that all those particles just bunch together and basically create a, a soup or a crystal or a solid, something where the normal properties of matter don't actually function or occur. The, the normal properties don't exist. Um, so that's what we talk about when we talk about electron degenerate matter. Um, and what he means by having no stable solutions is it's the, the best I can describe that is to say that the math falls apart. Just like Josh and I were talking about with the Planck length with, uh, with quantum mechanics and as you get really, really tiny and you get really, really close to things, all of a sudden you have to account for um, you know, Schrodinger's formula, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, the fact that matter is both waves and, and particles and things like that. Um, so if you look at, as you get smaller and smaller, uh, in looking at anything in general, um, the solutions, the mathematical solutions, as in, oh, where's the baseball? Well, that I can do. I can do a formula. It was hit 40 yards and, and it fell and it's now in this location. Um, but as you get closer and closer to the baseball, and I'm talking about, like, you know, at the subatomic level, you get mm-hmm. to the point where you can't actually determine where the baseball is because the baseball is nothing more than a wave function. So it has no stable solutions. So Chandrasekhar figured out the same thing for mass, for matter. As you get, uh, as, as the amount of matter that you have increases and increases, eventually it starts to, uh, not function according to the formulas and laws that we've figured out for pretty much all of matter that exists. And this is the beginning of the thinking of the black hole, the right. whole collapsing the blanket, the whole creating a funnel, cr- collapsing the universe in on itself. Um, Chandrasekhar figured out that um, once you get to a certain point, shit just makes no no sense. It, it just goes 
off off the handle. It makes absolutely no sense. So you know that was that was kind of uh, it was Einstein, Chandrasekhar, and uh, you know starting with the work of of John Mitchell um, developed this this concept of well maybe there could be a material so dense that it causes the universe to collapse in on itself. So that you know that was the kind of the development of black holes, um, and uh, everyone thought this was batshit crazy. But in 1939, Robert Oppenheimer, yes, that Robert Oppenheimer, um, there aren't that many others, the one associated with the atomic bomb. Um, predicted that neutron stars above approximately three solar masses, which is known as the Tolman Oppenheimer Volkoff limit. Who's Tolman? I have no fucking clue. Good deal. All right. Um, the stars above three solar masses would collapse into black holes for the reasons presented by Chandrasekhar and concluded that no law of physics was likely to intervene and stop at least some stars from collapsing into black holes. So, uh, whips a gumbel, Johnny Peppersnake, that's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to speak British here. Um, <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> just let it go. Um, All right. Um, that is, that is, you know, the, pretty much the, the, the bedrock for this concept of black holes. Everything that, you know, I'd say the most famous name in black holes is Stephen Hawking. Everything that he has done since then has been based upon this, the, the, the equations and formulas from Chandrasekhar and Oppenheimer and Mitchell. Right. And Einstein as well. So when we get to structure of black holes, we can talk about Birkhoff's theorem. Now I'm going to read this, and Josh will interpret. Oh, fantastic. I'm very excited. Birkhoff's theorem mm-hmm. can be generalized. Any spherically symmetric solution of the Einstein-Maxwell field equations must be stationary and asymptotically flat. So the exterior geometry of a spherically symmetric charged star must be given by the rensner nordstrom electrovacuum. <laughs> stuff <laughs> there are there is and 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 there are things that we know about stuff so I, and we trust in the things that we know that they are known things that we know about stuff. oh no knowns and unknown knowns and unknown unknowns he gets a lot of bad he gets a lot of bad press for that uh, no, but that it actually was, was correct brilliant. it was fucking brilliant so i will say um i i did write after that immediately after that i wrote uh I have no idea what that means. Written on my paper. So So that's 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 really the heart of the black hole the black hole phenomena. Um but do 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 Oh, I got it now. I said phenomena before oh you did that, God. and I just wondered what the hell was wrong with you. And I'm thinking, okay, Paul's doing a thing. But you're <laughs> phenomena. Do, 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 do. Phenomena. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I, I can't hear phenomena without hearing phenomena. That's fantastic. That's, that's the, that's the funny joke. I didn't, uh, I didn't grasp it that before. It takes a while so to catch up. It really does. Um, what does that seem to say about the nature of black holes as we understand them? Because it seems, again, very descriptive, but it doesn't seem to be telling us anything about black holes themselves. And I know there's nothing we really know per se, but there's a lot that we can say about them. And that was a, a whole lot of talking with, uh, I believe, two different theoretical postulates in there, yeah. Um, yeah. both unexplained. Uh, but is there anything explaining what that means or or if there's a way to determine what that means? Uh, uh, no. No, I have no idea what that means. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I actually, I, I did the legwork. I did the research. I looked up what Einstein Maxwell field equations look like. And then I, I uh, ran screaming to my bedroom and hid <laughs> under the covers for a while. Um, I understand the term stationary. I understand the term asymptotically flat. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to coalesce into any sort of comprehensible statement about the structure of black holes. Well, let's so, take a step back. I'm, maybe I misunderstood or maybe I didn't catch it because I was busy preparing myself to try and explain that and turn that into layman's terms. But what is that supposed to be telling us? What is that supposed to be saying? Even if we can't deduce what it is, what is it supposed to be trying to explain or justify or express? Well, <laughs> I'm, Ooh, he got you. Yeah, yeah, he did. Okay, um, I, th- I think ultimately what it's saying is, is, so if you take the Einstein-Maxwell field equations, um, they are approaching something that has to do with the, the fabric of the universe that I was talking about before, like Im- imagining going from three dimensions to two dimensions and talking about the blanket. The Einstein-Maxwell field equations are basically equations defining the location of that blanket mm-hmm. in three dimensions as opposed to two. So... <clears throat> 
what what Burkhoff's theorem seems to be saying, as far as I can understand, <laughs> um, is that the the curvature that results from the incredibly dense gravitational field that exists from the incredibly dense matter at the center of a black hole mm-hmm. uh, curves in onto the black hole and remains stationary. Now, this is significant because one of the things that happened a, a number of years ago was uh, the, the, the Large Hadron Collider was built. And people had theorized that the Large Hadron Collider, well, the scientists theorized that, hey, we might create microscopic mini black holes that exist for a femtosecond or two. Right. And then people heard this. The non- black holes. Non-science people and said, well, you're going to suck the earth into a, a black hole that you created. We're all going to die. And <laughs> that is not the case because what Burkhoff's theorem is actually saying here is that the, and I'm getting to the next topic, which is event horizon. The event horizon of a black hole, um, much like the, the, the spinning or rotating of the black hole that you discussed in your paper, is independent of the strength of the black hole. Now, what that means is... It doesn't matter if it's the world's strongest black or the, the universe's strongest <laughs> black hole or the universe's weakest black hole. It still is not going to affect you if you're like three inches away from it or five feet away from it or wherever the event horizon is. So, <clears throat> again, no matter how heavy that rock is on the blanket, no matter how far that blanket gets sucked down, there is a cusp where the rest of the blanket is unaffected. There's going to be a, basically a shoulder where the rest of the blanket is still floating on the water. Right. Part and, of the blanket will be there. Then there'll be a dip where right. the rock is, and part of the blanket will be on the other side, um, assuming it's a small enough rock. And it, and it doesn't matter how how steep the dip is or how far the dip goes down, it's still not going to propagate outside of where the funnel exists. Right. This goes back to the, uh, let's say, instead of blanket, the trampoline that Einstein talked about, dropping a bowling ball on a trampoline, where you get the slope down, but when it's not sloped, it's still a flat trampoline. Right. But as soon as you hit the slope, you roll down to where the bowling ball is, um, simply because that's where the slope begins. You're above the slope, you're fine, you're you're good. It just does not radiate any further than that. Right. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple more things I just want to get to here, and we'll we'll get through this quick, and then we'll we'll move on. the The event horizon, as we were describing here, uh, it's a boundary in space time beyond which events cannot affect an outside observer. In layman's terms, it is defined as the point of no return otherwise known as the point at which the the gravitational pull becomes so great as to make escape impossible. So the most common case of an event horizon is surrounding a black hole. Um, Light emitted from beyond the horizon can never reach the observer. Mm -hmm. Likewise, any object approaching the horizon from the observer's side appears to slow down and never quite pass through the horizon, with its image becoming more and more red-shifted as time elapses. The traveling object however, hits a firewall and is terminated at the horizon. Now, this, this, the reason why I bring up event horizon is because it, 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 it leads to an interesting question about black holes, which is, you know, what would it be like if we uh, you know, threw David into one? <laughs> sure, we should, we should do Fuck. that. <laughs> and so what would happen is, um, well, there's spaghettification, which right. is a term. Um, basically, all of, your, all of the atoms in your molecules would be rearranged into a thin spaghetti-like stream as you were sucked into the mm-hmm. black hole. But what would you would perceive? What you might theoretically perceive as you were falling into the black hole is uh, because black holes and the gravity that they contain actually warp space-time to such a significant extent, you, time would be dilated for you. So the process of spaghettification may, as far as we can tell, take what would seem to be a millennium, a million years, a hundred million years. You may be slowly being sucked into a spaghetti tube for the next hundred million years. So I probably wouldn't even notice. Or you would be conscious if you went feet first and be tortured for a hundred million years. Oh, I think true. we found hell. <laughs> oh, there you go. Problem solved. Yeah. Everybody's happy. So Science it's, is it's bringing best, us hell. It's best to go in as, um, as flat as possible. Sure. That's a yeah, good if you're gonna If you're going to jump off like uh, an eight-story building, go head first. <laughs> okay. That's the advice. Go head first. Okay. All right. So the last thing I wanted to mention was just one, one of the problems with black holes is... They don't work. 
according to our understanding of physics, at least classical physics. Um, and one of the greatest problems with black holes is the information paradox. Now, the information paradox basically is this. So, if you're floating around out in space like David does, um, and he's just you know kind of hanging out, and all of his uh, molecules are being molecules, and, and uh, you know electrons are floating around and, and everything like that, he is just a bundle of entropy. Uh-huh. Entropy being a measure of disorder of the universe. Um, entropy in the absence of enthalpy, which is heat, um, is the only thing that can make entropy go down. The universe tends to move from order to chaos. A good example of this is you, you take a take a vase or a vase and uh, you know drop it on the floor. It's going to increase its entropy by going from one vase to a hundred little tiny pieces of mm-hmm. vase. And this is the same thing for everything, and it's independent of gravity. Everything goes from a state of order to a state of disorder. The problem with black holes, and this is one that we don't actually have a solution for regarding you know our understanding of black holes and thermodynamics, is if you go from a random collection of molecules, a random collection of atoms... If you go from that to being squeezed into a black hole, wherein your molecules, your atoms are all rearranged in a very organized line, a very straight line, um, you have significantly decreased the entropy. You've created much more order. You're a much more ordered system if all your molecules are in a row or all your atoms are in a row, Mm -hmm. as opposed to being all willy-nilly and wherever they are. And the, the problem with that is black holes do not radiate heat. So there doesn't seem to be any energy in order to make the entropy go down. But don't, but isn't, isn't the whole thing behind a black hole is that they do, I don't know if radiate is really the right word, but don't they, 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 they radiate a gravitational pull. Why is that not, and how does that not work exactly? Because that seems to be what it's doing is it's, it's, I, 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 I hasten to say that the pull is sending energy out. But th- why is it not? Why is that not the case? Why is it not the, just a transference of, of gravity's pull um, being the the extra energy that's added into the system? <laughs> because again, as long as you're adding energy, you can get more and more more and more complex. Um, it's right. just that when you're you know you're not adding energy, that things tend toward disorder. Um, if you're adding the, the energy of the gravitational pull, is that not does that not solve the problem to some degree at least? Uh, well, it could. If we knew what the fuck gravity was, yeah, and that's that's ultimately yeah. the problem with uh, with this entropy problem. It's <laughs> also ultimately the problem with our understanding of black holes, what they do, how they exist, how they propagate, and whether or not we will be sucked into one before you know the sun explodes and and, and the earth becomes a fireball. Um, yeah, well, if we make it in a hadron collider, that'll be fine. Right, right, absolutely. So, I mean. <clears throat> Again, black holes is a difficult subject because there's really not a lot known about these these objects. Um, and on top of that, it's a difficult subject because what is known, as as Josh and I have tried to to wade through, is really incoherent and and gobbledygook. So, which is why um, you know this is our episode on black holes. We're, we're probably not going to touch super strength theory. No, um, no, I think we'll steer, steer about as far from super strength theory as we can get. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's black holes as, as best as we can present them. I, I will have to say, I think, you know, Josh and I have, uh, have, have met our, our challenge here as, as best we could. As best we could. I give it a two out of five. I'll fucking hit you <laughs> with a shoe. <laughs> Ooh, are, are, are you an angry George Muslim? George Bush. <laughs> yes. Oh, wait, no, that was the other way around. Yeah, damn. Yeah. I'm George Bush. physics vegan Brian declares good. He can only take so much bullshit. Ah, uh, yes. I, I noticed that there uh, very little constructive criticism from our doctoral physicist. Seriously, That's all man. I'm saying. What, what the fuck? That's all I'm saying. Yes, yes, that was a load of crap. Thank you, Doctor of Physics. <laughs> what do you have to put in? You have profanity. Profanity is your offer, sir. All right, all right. He, he backpedaled. He, say, he said he was referring to string theory. All right, because I, th- I thought we were going to fight. 
you know, you know, fist oh, we're, we're still going to fight. Raise up, throw down. I'm going to throw at least three Davids at him. <laughs> oh, that's that, that is quite the challenge. That's quite the challenge you've you've offered up. What he has to throw at you, I do not know. But I think uh, I think they're clever and witty barbs. <laughs> no, clever and witty. Well, he might throw the meat away from himself. Well, that makes sense. So if that would be it, would be his defense willing, mechanism. Willing to touch it. All right. Oh, so come on, Brian touches meat all the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, so there, okay. okay, okay. as long as I'm not alone. <laughs> oh, All right. Well, let's move on to You're Wrong and Let Me Tell You Why. Now we're going to have a, a quick little argument about... Uh, a very, very serious topic. A very, very important topic. Um, you know, I think entertainment is, is the crux of human or American existence, and I think uh, we're going to be discussing one of the uh, one of the most important people in one of the films One of the premier, today. premier, not only, not only um, um, creative minds, but one of the premier actors, and by the way, writer-director. Oh, yes. As well. <laughs> yes. Um, and yes, we printed out a filmography, so we know things that he's done. I, because I, he is, he is my... an icon in American cinema, and I think that everyone listening has 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 gotten the the, the enjoyment of this man, this this modern day chaplain of comedic sense and beauty, who's who's lightened all of our lives. Did you read the first sentence of the bio? <laughs> okay, whoever starts this argument needs to read the first sentence of the bio. Okay, flip the coin. Uh, I'll take the coin. You'll take the coin, and could you say the 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 name of the. Uh, Yes, the, yes. The topic is Rob Schneider is the greatest actor ever. Yep. Rob Schneider is the greatest actor ever. Paul is taking the coin. Heads will be the affirmative. And we have Tails. You're saying no, Rob Schneider is not the greatest actor ever. I am. And I'm confused and surprised about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, and did you want the uh, uh, the second paragraph? Is that what you, is that what you want to want read? No, I was actually thinking of the first sentence of the first paragraph. Okay. After leaving SNL, Schneider played supporting roles in a series of movies including Surf Ninjas, Surf Ninjas, Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd, The Beverly Hillbillies, Demolition Man, and Down Periscope. Now, we, we say what you will about th- the movie choices this man has made. I, right. I can't speak to one way or the other. He's a little bit of a funny looking guy. He's obviously, you know, not leading man material. Mm-hmm. So he's not going to do, he's not going to do any of the, the classic or iconic films. We're talking about his skill and his capacity as an actor, though. And this is a man who, first off, played a woman. He played a gigolo. <laughs> right? Both American and European. He played a stapler. Um, that's not exactly true. <laughs> um, let's see. He uh, he played um, a man in Grown Ups. Um, let's see. In Little Nicky. Huh. He's, you know, the, the breadth, the breadth of his roles is remarkable. He played an animal. Um, he played a girl. He played, um, I believe, an inbred Louisianian <laughs> in, in, uh, in The Water Boy. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't say, you know, you can, you can say, you can criticize his choice of roles, his choice of films, but the breadth of the different roles he has portrayed is remarkable. How many, imagine Brad Pitt, imagine Brad Pitt playing the hot chick. It wouldn't happen. Can't be done. Brad Pitt couldn't do that. He doesn't have the acting chops. Brad Pitt does not have that range. No, that's what I'm saying. He's incredibly widely skilled. He's, he's a powerful voice. For the little guy, you can do it. I mean, he's any number of things. He's 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 powerful. He's strong. He is he's 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 versatile, and that's what I have to say about him. Not many actors could play the number of roles that Rob Schneider has played and played effectively. I believed he was every one of those roles. And again, the movies are bad, but his job of acting, which is what we're talking about, phenomenal and extensive. Well, ultimately, the problem I'm having with this argument is. Um, from my position that, that Rob Schneider is uh, not the greatest actor ever, Yes, I would simply say exactly what you just said. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, so you're talking about, you're talking about an actor who won the 2005 Worst Actor Razzie Award for his role. And how many, in, how many in actors in, can claim that? In Deuce Bigelow, <laughs> European Gigolo, which I might add that he 
not only starred in, but he wrote and directed as well. So Rob Schneider, in his infinite wisdom, decided, you know that Deuce Bigelow movie I made, which nobody saw and, and didn't make any money? I think that I'm going to write a sequel. I'm going to direct it myself. I'm going to go to Europe, and I'm going to film myself, directing myself, writing myself. And that's what he decided to do, because Rob the meta Schneider... Text itself is brilliant. I'm, you take You take a movie that lost money... What do you do? You convince the studios to follow it up as a director, as a writer. Then you produce the movie yourself in a foreign land where you don't know the rules or the mores. You don't understand these strange European ways. The women don't shave their armpits. I mean, it's, it's chaos. It's crazy. And what does he do? He produces, while not a masterpiece, a solid film. I believe Was it, was it a solid film? You, you enjoyed believed, it? <laughs> I believed he was, in fact, a gigolo. And I believed he was in Europe. And if you're saying he wasn't in Europe, then you didn't understand the nature of the movie. I have to say that the meta text alone, simply in that movie, shows that that doesn't really show his acting chops, which is what we're talking about. But it does show the genius inherent in someone like Rob Schneider. He's well, wide let's, ranging. Let's, let's talk about the choices that a Rob Schneider would make. Now, let's talk about his directorial debut Big Stan. I'm sorry, now, I've got to stop you right there. What does that have to do with his acting oh, we're, skill? We're getting there. Okay. We're, getting there. Okay. we're talking about the, the, the choices that Rob Schneider as a person makes in order to propagate his craft, which clearly he makes poor choices. So, so you're, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're talking about his acting skill, his acting chops, or are you talking about his agent? Because it sounds like you're talking about his agent. And if you're talking about his agent, has nothing to do with his skill as an actor. So, so what you're saying is that his directorial debut, Big Stan, yes. was a choice made by his agent, not by his brain. I'm saying that does not show in any way, shape, or form the qualities he has as a thespian. I think I think you're absolutely wrong on that. I think clearly the qualities of his ability to thespianize, um, like he played a hot chick. So yes, thespianize. Uh, are, are directly related to his decision-making process in his career. Now, you're talking but about they, someone who makes absolutely poor choices and makes them both in and out of the films that he is starring in, producing, and directing, and writing. No, we're talking about we're talking about specifically one aspect of his character, which thus far I don't believe you've criticized in any way, shape, or form. You've criticized him as a person. You've criticized his, his business acumen. You've criticized his understanding of the entertainment industry. But thus far have not really criticized his skill as an actor, which is what the, the subject of conversation and, and here. So, I, yes, he chooses bad movies, but he's funny looking. It has, <laughs> I mean, he, he is. He's funny looking. He's, he's short. He's kind of weird. You know, he's, he's obviously someone that's looking for niche roles, which he found when he played a man possessed by animal spirits or whatever the hell happened in the animal. Um, <laughs> the when, stapler. When he played a man trapped in a woman's body or a, a I believe it's a hot chick that turns into an ugly man. Yes, Either that would way, be the hot chick. Yes. Either way, this is not something that any random actor could do. I'm, Picture, picture Lawrence Olivier trying to do the hot chick. You keep trying to throw in like saying, Brad Pitt, Lawrence Olivier. I'm just well, give, okay. Quick. Okay, let me ask you this: What is acting? That's what give I'll me ask a you. A better actor than Rob Schneider. Who do you got? Oh, um, Lawrence Olivier, <laughs> Brad Pitt, uh, David. Oh, thank and you. how many of them <laughs> could play the hot chick? Not well, many of David. them. Were, not many of them were cast in it. So I obviously, it. the directors and producers did not believe anybody see, else could see, play it. They believed that a, a hot chick turned into a guy that looks like Rob Schneider, a role tailor-made for someone with the acting skill, the talent, and the, 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 the force of charismatic character that's required for this role. He, he, Rob Schneider, demigod. All right, well, I, I think I have, you know, the, the, the ultimate conclusion to this argument. Please. And it will absolutely ensure that I am clearly the winner here. Um, most recently, according to his biography... Rob Schneider appeared as the title character in the CBS TV situation comedy Rob, which was loosely based on his real life. This series was canceled by CBS in May 2012. Because his real life is not as interesting as he is in his acting roles. Clearly a mistake in business, but not a mistake in acting, because a man that cannot compellingly sell himself as himself is not a man that can't sell another character. I think, I think that what you're saying is Rob Schneider's not good at being Rob Schneider. 
That doesn't mean he's not good at being, you know, the animal. <laughs> he's not good at being Deuce Bigelow. And I think that's what you need to present. present. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> we want to know what you think about Rob Schneider. <laughs> so uh, email us at reason at wnyatheist.org. Now, in, in the, uh, the, the... I, n- I never saw Deuce Bigelow European Chicago. I seriously haven't seen any of these movies. I didn't even know it existed. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can he act? I don't know. Um, you should ask my wife. She'll tell you how good they were. Yeah, she's, she's a big fan. Yes. Okay, um, well, I have seen a couple of do- I have seen a couple of his movies, and they're not good. Eh, they're entertaining enough. The, you know, the, what's he gonna do? The sum total I know about Rob Schneider is I found his making copies character on Saturday Night Live really annoying. Well, I gotta tell you, I did believe that someone was making copies though. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think I think that that about sells it. He's a bad Hollywood type, but not a bad actor. All right. Well, thanks for staying with us at the bottom of another episode of Reason. It was long, but completely incoherent. So, yeah, yeah that's something right there. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so, uh, join us next week as we talk about drug testing. And drug testing. Josh and I will certainly not have anything to say on that subject whatsoever. Nothing. All right. So, until next week, farewell. Bye-bye. Have a good night.